Welcome to Free Christian Church of God's video outreach ministry, bringing the gospel message of Jesus Christ into your home each and every Sunday morning. If you would like more information about the video ministry or other ministries that we have to offer, stay tuned immediately following this program. And now, open your Bibles and follow along as we bring you today's message. All right, you are there. Good, good. Hebrews chapter 12, lift your Bible in the air. Say it along with me. This is my Bible. It's God's infallible word. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have, and I can do what it says I can do. Today, I'll be taught the word of God. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. And I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Do you believe that? <coughs> Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, I pray for your anointing over this word. God, I pray that you will do a great work in this church amongst these people. Father, I pray that you'll save another lost soul today at this altar. God, that you'll continue to do what you started here. And God, that you will complete this work. Father, I, I thank you for what is in store for us. God, I, I can't see things from day to day along the way. And God, there are days when I get discouraged. There are days when I get depressed. There are days when I get nervous. But God, I know ultimately that you are a sovereign God in control of all things at all times. God, all we have to do is be obedient. And God, I pray that we will do our part in being obedient to you. That you could finish the work that you've given to us as a church. To bring others into your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. As a born-again saint of God, we are obligated to set our sights on and to strive to achieve our objective. I want to ask you this morning, as a born-again Christian, what is your final objective? What are you working toward? What are you, as a Christian, what are you now committed to? Most people would probably say heaven. Most believers consider that their objective is their final reward, a mansion on a street of gold in a heavenly paradise where they live forever and ever in the presence of God. They believe that their final objective is heaven. They'll say, all that matters to me is that I make it to heaven someday. That's all I care about. The only thing that's important to me is that I make it to heaven when I die. But because they're confused as to what their final objective should be, salvation has become nothing more than fire insurance. Eternal heaven instead of an eternal hell. But when somebody says, all that matters to me is that I make it to heaven when I die, what they are really saying is there are a whole lot of other things that are more important to me than living for God right now. I want to read to you a quote from my book, Dig Your Valley Full of Ditches. It says, We are asleep in our faith, for we have become bored with our Christianity that is ineffective. For it has been infected by trivial teachings that are meant to appeal to our flesh. We've lost sight of our goal, which is heaven. And we focused on trivial pursuits, attempting to replace our eternal reward with a heaven on earth. It doesn't work. For all, our only hope is in heaven, and true happiness cannot be found, not even in the roses that we smell along the way, unless our faith is fixed upon the climax that will be in the presence of the Lord. In these final days, when every hand is needed in the harvest field, God's church isn't doing God's work because God's people have lost their focus. Our goal is heaven. That's where we want to end up when this life is over and we step into eternity. But our objective is to be something entirely different. 
This is where Christianity succeeds or where it fails. This is what separates a real, living, vibrant saint of God from a carnal Christian. If we don't know what our objective is, then the odds are we are not pursuing it. And if somebody doesn't come along and point out to us where we've been misinformed and where we need to get our act together, then we will miss what we're supposed to be hitting. If we don't know what our objective is supposed to be, then it's a pretty good bet that we will never achieve that objective. If we don't know what we ought to be working on, then we will most likely waste a whole lot of our life burning up our time and using up our resources on things that ultimately do not matter. Worse yet, if someone has been teaching us the wrong things, and church, there's a lot of bad theology out there. You need to watch what you hear. Theology that says sin doesn't really matter, or sin is what you make it out to be. Theology that says that live like you want because it's all under the blood. Theology that says God is here to reward you and to give to you and to serve you. Even those things might be popular and appealing, and even though they are are the, the things that some of your Christian friends are pursuing, if you adhere to those teachings, you will waste your life and your mission and still never accomplish your objective. So you need to know what your objective is. I'm teaching you today, so pay close attention to this. As a born-again child of God, your objective is to be Christ-like. To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask is to be like Him. All through life's journey, from earth to glory, all I ask is to be like Him. God has a plan for you, and that plan is to turn you from the man or woman that you used to be into the spitting image of His Son. Your objective is to present your body to God as a living sacrifice, and then you must allow the Holy Spirit to renew your mind so you will have the mind of Christ so you can see your objective clearly. Having then surrendered your body and your mind, you will then allow God to mold you and shape you into the image of your Son. That is your objective. When you confuse your goal with your objective, not only are you ineffective as a Christian, but you also become vulnerable to be used by the enemy to hinder other people from entering into the kingdom of God. When you confuse your goal with your objective, you run the risk of becoming a carnal Christian. Jesus told us that we hold the keys to the kingdom. Whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. It is up to us. We are the gatekeepers. God is concerned about your testimony. Not only the one that you stand up and and deliver on Sunday night or not the one that you paste on Facebook, but God is concerned about the testimony that you deliver every day of your life by how you live and how you act and how you react and interact with the world that's around you. But because some who call themselves a Christian are not really Christ-like, they have become an obstacle to those who need Christ. They made Christianity to appear to be something fake or shallow, and they're binding those that God wants to set free. Those who don't know Christ are looking at them, and they're thinking, if that's Christianity, then I'm not interested. Our objective is to be Christ-like, to be so much like Jesus in all that we do, that when people look at us and observe us, they don't see the fallen creature that we have been in the past. They don't see some mutant combination of the old person we used to be and the new Christian that we claim to be. They don't see some amalgamation of sinner and saint, but they see Jesus only. But if we're confused... And if we think that our objective is one and the same as our goal, then we will abandon our objective and our only concern will be to make heaven when this life is over. Are you with me? Our goal is heaven. That's where we all want to finish. And if if we're truly born again, that's where we will finish because that was taken care of when we put our sin and our past under the blood of Jesus. We got heaven when we got saved. Amen? Amen. We got heaven when we got saved. We don't need to work our way on getting into heaven. Some people are like, well, I'm just working my way to heaven. I'm doing the good things. I'm avoiding the bad things. We don't need to work on heaven. Heaven is a done deal. We're not climbing a spiritual ladder hoping to get there someday, but our goal is fixed and guaranteed. Jesus said, I'm going and preparing a place for you, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to take you there. We don't need to work on heaven, but what we do need to work on is the life that we are still living here on this planet. There is a reason that when someone surrenders their life to God, he doesn't just take them into heaven. I mean, it'd be pretty cool because we'd know who all was saved, right? 
And then those of us who are left also have some problems, right? But that doesn't happen. There is a reason that after we repent of our sin and we surrender our life to God that we continue to live on in this world. There's a reason that we celebrate mountaintops and we suffer through valleys. There's a reason that we face trials and we battle enemies. There is a reason that we have good days and we have bad days. Listen to me here. That reason is our objective. Do you hear what I'm saying? Why are you going through what you're going through right now? Why is, is this time in your life so difficult? Why, as a born-again child of God, you're, you're living in righteousness, but you're still fighting battles and you're facing enemies and you're dealing with unfairness? Why is all of this happening to you? It is God trying to help you reach your objective. You say, God, I want to be like Jesus. And God said, I'm going to help you be like Jesus. But you need to walk through this. We got home Friday night from our vacation. Vacation's pretty cool. Wish I could afford to be on one for months. I like sitting on the beach, doing nothing, anticipating where I'm going to eat. I could get into that. I really could. And, and, and we had a, this vacation go, yeah, yeah, we had a good vacation. We got home Friday night. Saturday morning we got up, and I studied for a couple of hours, and then I came out to the church, went home. We were getting ready to go down and do another job that we had to do. Got the phone call that Mandy and Noah had been in an accident, and then I called, called and talked to Pastor Mike, and we talked a little church business, and I told Lisa, I got back in the van, I said, I feel like I just stepped off the plane got hit by a semi-truck. It doesn't take long for the life to come back. But it is God trying to help me reach my objective. Have you ever thought of your problems that way? Have you ever thought of the trials you're going through? Is what I'm going through right now, this is God's hand. God's hand is in this, this valley that's here in front of me. Sometimes God will let you go through a valley, and sometimes God will pick you up and set you down in a valley because he's trying to help you reach your objective. Some of you are all bent out of shape because you're going through a rough time right now. You think God ought to be showering you with blessings and you should be living in a mansion. You think that heaven should be right here and right now, but God is trying to help you reach your objective to be like Jesus. Satan will try to distract you from your objective. Some think that Satan's goal is to get Christians to deny Christ and reject their faith and fall off the deep end. And I'm sure that that would please him, but he also knows that that may never happen. As a born-again believer, you are a blood member of, of the family of God. You need to understand how this works. Satan can't change your relationship because your relationship with Jesus Christ isn't by a membership. It's not by a good deed that you've done. It's not by how nice you are or how often you go to church. Your relationship with Jesus Christ isn't based on a book somewhere in a chapel by the road, but it is by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are bought by the blood, you are born by the blood, and you are now related to God by the blood. It is the blood that makes you a child of God, and the devil can't change that. Somebody ought to be shouting amen right now. But if the devil can distract you, if he can mislead you and get you to pursue the wrong things, he knows that he might be able to talk you into leaving your father's house. He might be able to entice you to leave the hedge of your father's protection and eventually lure you into the hog pen and steal from you everything valuable that you have. It's then that he accomplishes his goal. And that's for you to abandon your objective and to make you useless as a gatekeeper in the kingdom of God. When as a believer you're not pursuing your objective, your life becomes only about yourself. Listen to what I'm telling you here. When you're not aiming for that objective of being like Jesus, your life becomes only about your goals and your wants and your problems and your little trivial pursuits. You do nothing to bring other people into the kingdom of God. You don't have the time. You don't have the energy. Your money is tied up in your investments, and your time is tied up in your own agenda. You're too tired. You're too busy. There aren't enough hours in a day or days in a week because you are wasting away your time not pursuing your objective. Your prayers have become a to-do list for God. God, give me this thing. And God, give me that thing. And God, help me out of this mess. You don't have the time to be concerned for those who need God. You're doing nothing to bring the lost into the kingdom because you are preoccupied with yourself. You come to church and you think it's all about you. You grumble and complain about the things that don't suit you. But people are listening to you. 
People who that don't know your God are listening to you. People who don't understand the church and the role of the church are listening to you. People who've heard the lies of the world but they've never heard the truth of the gospel are listening to you and they're being turned off because all they hear from you is what is wrong and how bad it is. You're not using your keys to loose people and let them into the kingdom, but you are locking them out and discouraging them and turning them away. You are binding instead of loosing. You're keeping people out of the kingdom that you should be letting in, and you are useless as a gatekeeper because you are not pursuing your objective. When people are at the altar being saved, and all of heaven is in a state of rejoicing, but you are grumbling about your pet you have stopped pursuing your objective. Our objective is to be Christ-like, but to become Christ-like, we have to let go of some things in our life that are contrary to who Jesus is. Steve and Judy came over last night and brought pizza. That was wonderful. We hadn't eaten all day. I hadn't eaten since vacation. <laughs> Messed me all up. They come over. We'd had kind of a long day. And I told Steve, I said, Steve, you ever realize that only dead things don't change? All living things are in a constant state of change. If something is alive, it is changing. It is always becoming. It is always moving. But something that is dead doesn't change. You see, if you don't want any change, you want death. You want something dead. You don't want something that's alive. We have to be set free from the things that restrain us from becoming as Jesus is. We have to be willing to forfeit not only our sins, but also the things in our life that are not like Jesus. What would Jesus do? What would, where would Jesus live? Where would he go and what kind of things would he do? The trouble is there are some Christian people who fight God if he ever tries to take their unchristlike things from them. Now, they'll gladly give God their sins. They'll gladly allow him to wash away their past from their record. But when God asks them for their stuff, he's in for a fight. What do you mean I have to give that up? What do you mean I have to stop doing that or have to stop going there? I went to an altar once. I said a prayer repents. I'm going to heaven when I die. That's good enough for me. But God, don't ask me for that. You need to take your hands off of that. Don't be touching that, God. What are you fighting to hold on to? What souvenir from your past are you trying to carry out of the grave with you? What do you need to give up that you're protecting and defending? What do you have in your life that you don't need in your life that you just keep justifying holding on to? Here's where some of you fight me as your pastor. I'm preaching to you God's word, okay? I don't know what I'm going to preach from Sunday to Sunday until the Holy Spirit gives it to me. And I will sit down at my computer and I'll begin typing notes and I will be as amazed as anybody else as what goes on the page. But I know that that is my source. I preach to you God's word. I'm preaching to you the truth. The Holy Spirit is convicting you. And you know that you need to make some changes in your life, but you are fighting to hold on to some things that God wants you to get rid of. All too often, somebody will come forward in the service, and they give their life to Christ, and everybody rejoices. We give them a hug or a handshake, and, and we welcome them into the family of God. But then sometimes we're guilty of walking away and leaving that newborn Christian stand there alone. Jesus Christ commanded us in the Great Commission to not only bring people into the kingdom, but we are also then to disciple those newborn Christians to him. We're, we're here to show them the ropes and to teach them how to walk with God, to advise them of what God expects and remind them about God's love and compassion and his forgiveness. That's what the church is here for. We are here to teach you how to live by the word of God. Jesus said to those at the tomb of Lazarus, loose him and let him go. I have raised him to life, he's come forth out of the grave, and now it's your job to loose him and let him go. It's your job to take off the grave clothes. It's your job to help him take off the things that he no longer needs. It is your job to free him up so he can walk and he can talk like the living instead of stinking like the dead. Maybe you're a new Christian today. You have this new life in Christ, you're, you're saved from your past, and God has given to you a new start. You've been raised to life by the power of God, and you have got up and you have walked out of the grave. But you're still wrapped in your grave clothes. And you're wondering, where do I go from here? I mean, what do I do next? Am I finished or am I just getting started? Am I alive? And if I am, 
Why do I have trouble moving? I'm alive, but I still can't see very well. I'm alive, but I, I might as well be dead because I'm still bound like a dead man, and I don't know what to do. Church, there are resurrected people all around us. There are those who were once dead in their sins that Jesus Christ has raised to life again, but they are still bound in the bonds of death, and they need to be delivered. They need to be set free. We, have, we have brought them into the church, and we preached to them the gospel, and they responded to God's call, but our job isn't finished yet. They need to be set free. They need to be set free. But what is confusing is when this newly resurrected Christian looks around the church and they see other resurrected people still wearing their grave clothes. I'm going to let you think about that one for a while. They're saved. They walked out of the grave. God's called them to life, and they're, they're coming out of the grave, still wrapped in this stuff, and they're looking around at people who have been resurrected for quite some time now who are still wearing their grave clothes. There's some resurrected people who still want to wear the grave clothes. It's considered vogue in some circles to keep some of the grave clothes on. It's not even ex only acceptable, but it's also expected to keep some of your old habits and your old sins, to carry some souvenir from the grave, so when you step out of the church, you'll still blend in with the walking dead on the outside. As a born-again, resurrected child of God, you are being watched. You're being observed. When a dead man walks out of the grave, people pay attention. What is our sudden fascination with zombies? Have you noticed this lately? I, oh, I see some of you. I read your Facebook. Oh, you can't wait till the zombie dead gut guy shows up on TV. You know, the next program's coming out. I, I, what, I don't know what our fascination is. There are movies, there are T-shirts, there's all kinds of things, video games. Hebrews 12 1 says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. People are watching. When somebody walks out of the grave, all that this world expects is a zombie, an animated dead man, a monster without a soul. Once you've accepted Christ and you profess your faith, you'll soon find that there are people watching you and they're analyzing you to see if this thing that you call salvation is real. They want to know if you are a new living being or you're just a zombie that's walked out of the grave. They're studying to see what it's all about. And some might even be waiting for you to slip up so they can put you back in your tomb. You're subjected to the scrutinizing examination of the skeptical, the critical, and the worldly. And for that reason, you have to be truly alive. You're being watched, and you have to be holy and live above reproach and an example of what Christianity is all about for the people who cannot see Christ but can only see you. Most of us become more responsible when we know we're being watched. If we know that somebody can see us, we're a little more careful in what we do and how we do it. Some of you have finally caught on that you're on television on Sunday mornings. And you are now more discreet than you used to be. You now make sure that you have your Bible in your hand when it's time to lift your Bible in the air. You, you now sneak your Cheerios and your Fruit Loops into your mouth. You try to keep your eyes open at all times. You've stopped picking your nose. Because you know somebody's watching you. Somebody built a new house behind ours. We used to have an open field and an open view to the sunset and no neighbors close enough to see what we were doing. And it was great. We didn't have to worry about somebody peeking in because there was nobody back there to peek in. But that was then. Somebody came along built a house back there. One evening, our new neighbors were sitting on their back porch enjoying the evening. Jacob was getting ready for bed. He was in his I am going to bed attire. <laughs> he walked past the French doors that were then on the back of our dining room, and when he did, our new neighbors waved. That will cramp your style, let me tell you. You're being observed. As Christians, we are being watched and we are being scrutinized. So that doesn't mean that we need to hang up some curtains and put up some blinds and hide what we're doing so nobody will notice, but it means there are now some things that we need to change. There's some things that are in your life that you need to exit your life so when people observe you, they don't see what they're not supposed to see, but they will see Jesus. The author of Hebrews says, let us lay aside every weight. 
A couple of Sundays ago while I was here, I, I spoke to you about dieting and how we know that for real success, it can't be a, a whim or a fad, but there has to be a complete change in our lifestyle if it's ever going to work. You can't successfully serve God and have substitutes that appease your old desires. There was a fellow on TV a while back who had lost 100 pounds. He said that he completely gave up sugar. When the interviewer asked if he used sugar substitutes, he said, no, what would be the point in that? For real success, there has to be a complete change in our lifestyle. We have to rid our palate of the taste for the wrong things. What we do to take off the weight is most often a fling or a fad, but if it's not a permanent change in who we are, we know that we will eventually backslide and begin to act like we did in the past. Sadly, our relationship with God is often the same. We start out like a house of fire, and then we cool down like an ice cube in the deep freeze. We go from being extremely saved to being extremely disinterested. We're determined that we're going to do it right and we're going to buy all the stuff and we're excited and we do it for a while, but then we hit the wall. We hit the wall of temptation. We hit the wall of past feelings and emotions. We hit the wall of our old unsaved friends. We hit the wall of weak moments and old memories. The devil throws temptation on our path. The enemy attacks us and we are stressed and burdened and tired. We find that being a Christian is often difficult. So what we do is we take the easy way out. We turn down the easy road and we give up and we slide right back into our old dead life. And we abandon our objective. True salvation is a complete change of life. It's a complete change of attitude, a complete change of philosophy, a complete change of habits. And often it involves a complete change of friends. That is our objective. You can't successfully serve God and have substitutes that appease your old desires. You can't separate yourself to God and still feed the old man of the flesh. You can't be holy and sanctified to God and still feed the dead man or the dead woman that you used to be. You can't play church. You can't pretend to be a Christian, but you have to finish what God has started in you. You have to shed the weight and the restraints that are holding you back so you can achieve your objective of becoming like Jesus. Now, in order to do that, the Word of God says there's two things that need to happen. First of all, you need to strip yourself of sin. And second of all, you need to lay aside your weights. Your sin has to be washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Sin is a trespass against God and his laws. God has written the book on life and how we're supposed to live it. If we do it right, he calls it righteousness. If we do it wrong, he calls it sin. It's as simple as that. There are no exceptions to the rules. There are no escape clauses. There are no excuses. And there is no such thing as not knowing right from wrong. Nobody is so stupid or so ignorant or so unaware that they don't know right from wrong. God said in Romans chapter 1 that he has revealed himself to all men so that we are all without excuse. We all know how we are supposed to live. We also know what our sins are. Sometimes we plead ignorance. We want to plead insanity. We want to convince God that we were coerced into doing what we did, or though we have a great excuse for doing what we do. But God knows and we know that when we sin, we do it deliberately. Hebrews 10, 26 tells us if we sin deliberately, we know the truth. There remains no more sacrifice for sin, but the only thing that we can look forward to is a certain fearful judgment of God. What does that mean? That means that if you're really God's child and you get out of line, expect a spanking. You are God's child. You are carrying God's name. You are now his representative to your family and to your friends and to your community. Let your conduct fit your title. And if it doesn't, God said, I will let you know. Ephesians 4 1 says, walk worthy of your calling. Sin should never be an issue for the Christian. It's not an issue for God. It's never up for debate. God's standard never changes. You can have all the excuses in the world, but if God tells you that it's sin, then it's still sin. The world might say that it's right and acceptable, but it's still sin. Other people who call themselves Christians might be doing it, but God says it's still a sin. And if God says it's sin, then it's not your right, it's not your freedom, it's not your constitutional indulgence. But as Jesus told the woman taken in adultery when he forgave her of her sins and he raised her to a new life, he said, go and sin no more. No more. If we confess our sin, God will forgive us of that sin. He washed it from our account by the blood of Jesus. But sin isn't the only thing that will sidetrack us. The Bible says that we also carry weights that will throw us off course. 
and they'll restrain us from reaching our objective to be Christ-like. So we must voluntarily take those things off ourselves. We strip ourselves of our sin by repenting before God and putting that sin under the blood of Jesus, but weights are things that we must voluntarily lay aside. Hebrews 12, 1 says, lay aside the weights that so easily beset us. Weight can't be taken from you. It has to be surrendered. When you go to the doctor, there are usually two things that he tells us to do. One, stop the obvious, you know, stop the smoking, drinking, the drugs, and all that. The other is, lose weight. Every time I go to the doctor, we discuss weight. The first thing that they tell me to do when I go in is grab the hook, hang here, and we're going to see how much you weigh. But my last trip to the doctor, I had lost 30 pounds. Some of you noticed because my face looked thinner. I lost 30 pounds in my face, which makes me wonder how big my head actually was. I couldn't wait this time to be weighed because the nurse always made a big deal out of it. The doctor made a big deal out of it. So I got in there, and the nurse had me get up on the scale, and she got a little clipboard, and she goes, mm-hmm, and then she turns and walks away. Now, that wasn't really her fault because my wife never changed. You know, all the years going to the doctor, you know, it's pretty much always the same. But she got about halfway down the hallway and she stopped. She turned to me. She said, what did that say? I said, it said I lost 30 pounds. Write it down because me and the doctor are going to talk about it. <laughs> Have you noticed that the definition of obese has changed over the years? You take a look at that chart on the wall in a doctor's office, and there probably isn't anybody here who fits that ideal standard. For my, for my weight, I should be about six foot seven. So I'm heightening now. Uh, <laughs> but how many of us are freaked out by that? Does it bother you when you look at the chart in the doctor's office and you don't measure up? We stay fat because we justify the extra weight that we carry. We don't take it seriously. We laugh about it. We make light of it. But we don't lose it because we are somehow gratified by keeping it. Now, we'd love to be thin, but there are things in our life that we refuse to surrender. But the truth is, we know that we will pay for it someday. Our negligence will eventually catch up to us. As Christians, we know to stop the obvious. But just as in our physical life, in our spiritual life, we justify carrying those weights. These weights are things that aren't addressed in the Bible as right or wrong. There are some issues in the Bible that the Bible doesn't speak directly to. There are some things that weren't available 2,000 years ago. There are things that God has left to our own discretion and our own personal judgment. The trouble is, over the years, the standards in our world has changed. God's chart is still the same. His standard is still the same, but our world has changed. And our world has moved further from God. And we look at that chart instead of looking at God's. There are weights in our life that have been pointed out to us by the Holy Spirit that we don't need. The things that we'd be better off living without, the things that don't contribute to our well-being, they don't help us in any significant way, they're a weight to our testimony, they're a hindrance to our walk with God, and we can't be fully Christ-like as long as we keep that on. We know that we'd be better off without it. We could run race of life better, we could last longer, we could finish higher, but instead of surrendering it to God, we just justify it, and we continue to carry it. There are things in your life and on your life that you don't need, things that aren't helping you, things that you'd be better off living without, but because of your pride and because you're still feeding that old man to the flesh, you justify carrying them with you out of the grave. Every morning you pick them up and you put them on, you carry them to the breakfast table, you take them with you to work, you bring them home at the end of the day. And then you wonder, why are you weary? Why is there no joy in your walk with God? Why are uh, you you're trying to live for Christ, but you're still wrapped in the bonds of death? And you need to be set free completely. There are grave clothes on you that need to come off of you. You're, not, you're alive in Christ, but you still look like a dead man. You still smell like a dead man. You still move like a zombie because you're not completely free. The Bible says, to whom the sun sets free, is free completely. You see, I don't believe that the altar is just a place to repent of sin. A guy told me a couple of weeks ago, he said, yeah, the altar of the church he used to went to, people only went there when they wanted to become a Christian. So anytime anybody knelt at the altar, it was just because somebody was lost. But I believe that the altar is a place of deliverance. It is a place where we get set free from the things that hold us back. And, and your thing might be different than my thing. 
Okay, the thing the thing that holds me back might be different than the thing that holds you back. But you know what your thing is. You know what your weight is. When you fly now, they weigh your suitcases. 40 pounds. That's all you can put in your suitcase. Lisa went out and bought a really light suitcase. And yet when we came home, (laughs) we were going to be overweight. So we just moved it all to the van that Jimmy and Marcus was driving, and we let them carry our weight home. The thing is, we're being weighed. We're being weighed by the world. The people that are looking at us, and they're trying to find Jesus, but they, they, they are distracted because of the weight that we're carrying. And there's some things that we need to be set free from. And, t- and today, the invitation is for you to come and lay that old trinket that you've brought out of the grave to lay it down at the altar, let God put it in the grave and bury it. Something you need to get rid of, something you don't need, something's not helping you, something that is hindrance to you, hindrance to your testimony. You just need to give it up. God's telling you what it is. You know what it is. And God will set you free. I'm here to tell you, whatever it is, you don't need it. Leave it in the grave of the dead man or the dead woman that you used to be. And let God unwrap your bonds of death that are keeping you from your objective so he can make you into the spitting image of his son. Father, I pray today for this time of invitation, God, that we will be obedient to what the Spirit is saying to our heart. God, there are things that we need to let go of. They're not important. They're not worth the fight. They're not worth the battle. God, they're only a problem. And God, I pray today that we'll do that. God, that you will deliver people and set them free. Whatever it is, deliver them and set them free. So they can live in joy. So they can have strength and energy and enthusiasm that they're unable to have because of what they've been carrying. Help them to let it go. In Jesus. Thank you for watching today's message from Free Christian Church of God in Continental Ohio. To find out more information about Free Christian Church of God, or to receive a copy of Rev. James Fry's weekly television program, Your Life, call the church office at area code 419-596-3103, or visit our website at freecog.org and download your copy today.